I usually just read the word in Primus, and I wasn't sure how to pronounce it until this morning when a colleague of mine, Shannon, helped me find a video online that Hillsdale provided that helped me learn how to pronounce in Primus, in addition to several other Latin words. I took French, so I'm sorry. I never learned Latin. Um, but I receive in Primus, and I enjoy it, and now I even know how to say it. And I recommend that those of you who don't already subscribe to Hillsdale's newsletter in Primus, that you do so, because it's wonderful. I think the most recent cover story was about Clarence Thomas, so it is always full of excellent information. Um, but Dr. Arn, I hope you'll convey my thanks to the people at Hillsdale who made the video that helped me learn how to say in Primus. Uh, <laughs> yes, I learned, whoever, I, and I learned it for free. And Hillsdale puts out a lot of content like that so that you can just learn things that are interesting to you and are valuable to know. But really, thank you, Dr. Arn, for making the time to come to Raleigh, despite what I know was a complicated schedule. Dr. Arn has come directly from Washington, D.C. to Raleigh. And so making that time to do so, we're so appreciative. And it means a lot that you're here tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to tell you uh, about Dr. Arn's past biography. But many of you, as I said, probably already know because you're familiar with his work. But Larry P. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College, where he is also a professor of politics and history. He received his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied at Worcester College at Oxford University, where he served as director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill, and confessed to me earlier that he did not like the weather. <laughs> From 1985 to 2000, Dr. Arn served as president of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. In 1996, he was the founding chairman of the California Civil Rights In Initiative, which prohibited racial preferences in state hiring, contracting, and admissions. Dr. Arn is the board director of the Heritage Foundation, the Henry Salvatore Center of Claremont McKenna College, the Philadelphia Society, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and the Claremont Institute. He served on the U.S. Army War College Board of Visitors for two years, for which he earned the Department of the Army's Outstanding Civilian Service Medal. In 2015, he received the Bradley Prize from the Lynn and Harry Bradley Foundation. Dr. Arnold is also the author of three books, Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection between the Declaration and the Constitution, and what we risk by losing it. And lastly, Churchill's trial, Winston Churchill and the salvation of free government. I wish he could talk to us tonight about all of those topics, but he will restrict his comments. So thank you all for supporting Dr. Arn. Thank you, Dr. Arn, for being here. Please help me welcome Dr. Larry Arn. Good evening. Can you hear okay? You know, I'm a poor public speaker, so if you can't hear, hold up your hand, I'll try to be loud. Uh, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, my old friend, Jane Shaw. I, uh, old friend, friend of long standing, Jane Shaw. I've known her and Richard for 400 years. <laughs> like everybody else, I always liked her better than I liked Richard. <laughs> But they're both forces of nature. It's good to be with you. I uh, live a weird life. I don't do this kind of thing for a living. I have this job that takes all my time. I told Jane earlier, I only do it when it's immoral to me. And your work here is so good and so fun. And the people involved with it are so fun that I am obliged to be of service to you if I can. And all of you who are helpful in this organization, I personally am grateful to you. What a fine thing to do. Uh, in Primus, uh, the Latin rule is that if you work for Hillsdale College, you say in Primus. And if you don't, it's in Primus. <laughs> Although Eric Hutchinson, 
Hillsdale College graduate. Did you meet the Hillsdale kid go to college when he, Eric went? No, he's older than you guys. Uh, how many Hillsdale graduates are there? Hold up your hand. Yeah. <laughs> we're full, but I'm prepared to negotiate transfers tonight. <laughs> Eric Hutchinson is a classic professor. And we have one of the best classics departments in the country. And I'll tell you, it's rare to be able to say that on the basis of evidence, but there's a national classics competition. And, uh, you know, every college, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, North Carolina, that has a class program to participate in. And we have a record that puts John Wooden's record of basketball to shame. And Eric Hutchinson, the only graduate who teaches in that program, and he's the one who told me how to say the word of privacy. Okay. I'm supposed to say a thing that might sound arrogant you're coming from me, which is what a college should be. And I'm going to talk about our college a little bit because that's where I get my experience. But I want you to know, for a reason I'm going to define, there's no college that can ever be the perfect college. Although the good ones are all sublime things. It's a sign of the dangerous and difficult time in which we live. The colleges are different than they used to be. From Plato's Academy, the 5th century BC, through early Christian period, through the medieval period, through the Renaissance, until about 1870, everywhere in the world, colleges thought of themselves as what they thought consistently all that time. And there's been a big change. It happened about 50 years later in America, in the early 20th century. And this change is consuming. And the point is, it's a microcosm. It's an exact, what happened was something changed in what fancy people think. And that has spread everywhere in the country. The troubles in the country today, the divisions in it, the behavior of the prince. Those things are all unprecedented. And they all come from things that have gone on in colleges, have been going on in colleges since the late 19th century. I'll name the thing before I tell you what the college, what, what, what's gone wrong. Well, I'll, I'll be why I'm wrong, too. So, I read an article in Aero, Aero, A-R-E-O magazine by a, name, a man named Daryl E. Pohl. You can look it up. He's a political science professor at Williams College. Williams College is always number one and number two in the nation in the Royal College. And he, I looked up his resume, I don't know him, but he's a standard form academic liberal. He thinks that the ability to teach is threatened at Williams College. Why? He describes it at length in this article. He says, uh, there are these uh, Black Lives Matter people and these Me Too people, and their principle is that if you're not one of them, you can't understand them. I'm going to tell you what a college is in a minute, but I will tell you that that idea is anathema to the idea of a college. It's the death of the whole thing that they've been stated. And what they do, their tactics are amazing. They uh, shout people down. They get in large groups. He, this Professor Paul, he tells the story. He, uh, he went and talked to them, listened to them. There's a world movement, by the way. A world, you know, which is Duh. And, uh, and they, uh, and they, uh, you are killing us. Killing us, that's the thing. And he says, uh, are there instances of someone being killed? 
And you know, by the way, the idea of a racial violent episode at Williams College is extremely implausible. They say, that's your whiteness talk. You're white. We can't talk to you. And these are 20 year old kids. Now, I, one of my points is going to be, they didn't think that up to themselves. Yeah, Somebody taught that up to them. And it turns out it's an initiative by the radical professors to take control of the whole university. Sometimes college presidents participate in this. But this poor Professor Paul, you know, who in another context, I would disagree with everything he thinks, I imagine. He, he went to a fancy college and he got a job at Williams and that's a big deal. And he's afraid to teach anyone. Everything he says is scrutinized. If they make a charge against him, it'll take six months of his life to defend himself. They uh, rush into classrooms that overturn chairs. And what about, right? Then they demand changes to the curriculum. And remember, these people are 18, 19, 20, and 21 years old. That's my sweet spot. I know all about kids that age. They're hilarious, by the way. And they do the stupidest things. And it's charming. But they have never completed a curriculum. Most of them probably couldn't give a fair definition of what that is. And yet they demand, and then they get, changes in the curriculum. And when they say they're being killed, the remedy they ask for is counseling. And they care about the color of the people who counsel us. We want people of color to cancel us. See what that means? I mean, that's devastating, right? But the politics of the country are going the same way. Uh, the, the right reacts with uh, freedom of speech rules. Uh, and and I, I fancy that's not quite right. We have a speech code at Hillsdale College. It's old. What it says is, I'll tell you a reason for it in a minute. It says that you can say anything you want to if you can contrive to say it in a civil and academic manner. Stupid is allowed. You know, we're all stupid sometimes. The kids are often stupid. Although everybody in Hillsdale College is really smart. They're working really hard, get better all the time, right? But, in other words, well meant and considered is what's allowed. And, you know, if there's a breach in that, how do you judge it? Well, first of all, it doesn't happen very much. But then, usually, the typical conversation, if it gets to my office, it means it hasn't been settled somewhere. Else. But, I always say the same thing. What did you do? And the conversation is over already. You know, you have to sign an honor code to come to Hillstone College. It commits you to work. It commits you not to obstruct the operations of the college. It has a right to its principles. They are 175 years old. You can argue with the principles all you want. Just Figure out a way to do it so you don't frighten the horses of the people. Well, you can't say that now. In fact, in the face of that contest, you can't say anything. And that, that go read that article, look it up. Daryl E. Paul, Ariel Banks. Go look it up. And then read the newspapers the next one. And see if the national politics are not in the same condition, which is the next thing to buy us. That's my first point. It's a very serious situation. It doesn't amount to a collapse of freedom. It amounts to a collapse impending of freedom and civilization, both. So whatever it is, it's a mess. I have just two more points. One is, why did it happen? Well, these ideas came to be, and they're unique in human experience. 
They reached their flower in uh, early 19th and mid 19th century Germany. In America, they follow about 50 years. Uh, I, I ran across the biography of Lincoln Stanton not long ago, who was one of the progressive uh, journalists, one of the muckrakers, who was, you know, friends of Woodrow Wilson and friends of John Good, Frank Goodnow and friends of John Dewey. And uh, he was from California, and his father was a prosperous farmer. And his father sent his kids to, to Europe to study. And uh, so this, the, the story of the young, muckraking journalist, Lincoln Stephens, in Germany is that he alternates between writing fawning letters to his dad, please let me stay another year. And he reports in his diary, however, that he was meeting this liberating ideas that would change the world. And he left Berlin, where he studied. And you know, also, by the way, there was a lot of free sex. And I can tell you being a college business, young men like that. And, uh, and, and you know, because they're barbarians. Uh, <laughs> Some of them are here now. Some of my young men are here now, very civilized. They were born So he, he writes in his diary about that, but he, he writes a resolution in his diary. He says, In my career, I'm going to make the country unlike everything my father believes in. Who, by the way, had paid for all of that. <laughs> Woodrow Wilson, president of Princeton, says, the purpose of Princeton is to make young men, as all men then, as unlike their fathers as it is possible for them to be. Now, that's a quote. He, he later got elected president of the United States, having said that. So, where did it come from? There are two doctors. One of them is simply cynical. These are the main doctrines in modern philosophy. It's, uh, one of them is relativism. Whatever you think is true, because you think it's true. I can tell you that's everywhere now. Uh, Hillsdale College is a very weird place because it's famous and it's hard to get into. And so everybody, you know, it's, it coming to Hillsdale College is like joining the Marine Corps. You know, we, we recruit by telling them it's hell and it's probably not for you and we'll flunk you out if we don't kill you, right? <laughs> and everybody's smart, and everybody's committed, right? That's a very weird situation. And uh, not like the way it is today, because remember, the doctrine behind public education today is everybody has a right to an education. But think about that for a minute. How do you get one? If you say everybody's got a right to health care, it doesn't make much sense because by the way, you can ruin your health by your own actions. And to preserve it means you've got to do a bunch of stuff to take care of it. Education is much more dramatic than that. Because at every moment, I can tell you as a teacher, when a student is learning, it is harder work for the student than it is for the teacher. You can't get an education unless you really want one. Think of the test. All these social graduates here have passed this test. And when they started it, they were afraid of it. Sit on your fanny for three hours and read one of the greatest books ever written and concentrate on it. And there's no sign that can help you get a job. You have to teach yourself to love it. It will be infinitely good for you. But it's your struggle. And when they're not devoted, most of ours are, thankfully. We can't teach them anything. We can just help try to help overcome development. But now, Lincoln Stephens and every half the kids going to come more and more, they just think it's a buffet. And somebody else has paid the money, and I can walk up and get it. And that's relativism. Because, you know, if you uh, I'm, my particular business is torturing the young. <laughs> I, 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 I 
found my calling when I got admitted to a bunch of 18 to 21 year olds and got to ask them hard questions. And I'm the president, they have to, an they have to answer. You know, I mean today, the president of Focus on the Family came to, to visit with the kid, his name is uh, Jim Daly, I knew the other one, James Dobson, I didn't know him. And you know, he brought his wife and he brought his kid, and they're very eager to get into Hillsdale College, and I said, good, I'll take him lunch. And he thought, you know, the president's dining hall. I took him into the dining hall, the college dining room, and I found a table full of seven freshmen and two seniors whom I know, I didn't know the freshmen. And I said, make way, we're going to sit in four of us. And you know, I will tell you, it's a magic about a college dining table. There's, it doesn't matter if there's 200 sitting there at the table for six, there's always room for four more. <laughs> and so they all scoot around, and an hour later, you know, because it's easy, right? Because they've grown up in this world, right? And they're being, this is being taken from them. If you say to a kid, it's easy, it's always the same. If you say, what are you doing? And they tell you, and they say, why are you doing it? You never have to ask more than two questions before they say, in one word, some words or another, I'm doing it because it's good. And then you get to ask Socrates' question. What is it for a thing to be good? Relativism excludes that question. I had a kid, you know, 15 years, doesn't have much anymore. And he stood up and he said, should I go to Hillsdale or should I go to Princeton? And there were 600 people in the room. And I said, you should go to Princeton. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, well, you've used that name to taunt me. And that means you're interested in prestige. And that won't work in my place. And he said, if I come to Hillsdale, will you respect my opinion? And I said, we don't give a crap about that. In front of 600 people. I said, we're here to find out the truth of the matter. And all of our opinions are subject to scrutiny. And what do you think? You're special? <laughs> that boy is a great student. And he had got into Princeton, right? But, you see, that's what we do. And that's relativism. Relativism, however, is weak. And the reason it's weak is it doesn't give you anything to say to other people in the way of influence or a command. And so it's stronger, distant, nihilistic cousin. This is historicism. And what historicism is, is the trend of the age. That's Hegel and Kant, Heidegger, a Nazi. Right? And that's who Lincoln Stephens and Woodrow Wilson and John Dewey went to Germany to study with. And then wrote later, the Declaration of Independence is obsolete. And they brought that to a few colleges, and it spread, and it spread. I've just been talking to Jenna about uh, K-12 education. It's a top-down system where the derivatives of, of, of John Dewey and Woodrow Wilson at Harvard and Yale influenced their derivatives in all the public universities, you know, which are, by the way, usually have the standards of about high schools. And the distinguished ones all have great football teams. <laughs> you know, there's a Notre Dame in Cleveland, did you know that? We, we uh, lost to them, I'm ashamed to say, in the second round of the Division II National Tournament of Football. And uh, I said to the guy from, I like the president of it, I was talking to him. And see, most of these schools, by the way, they, they, they regret, they, the average high school student has a higher ACT score or SAT score than the average kid in a second tier college. And you know, it raises the question, why? Anyway, I said to him, what would it mean for you to win this national tournament? He lost the team that lost the team that won it. And we're the smartest school, as I mentioned, it's not saying much in Division Two. 
And my guys fumbled twice inside their five yard line. And I said, after the game with the boys, I said, you guys are supposed to be smart. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Anyway, he said to me, I said, I said well, what would it mean for you if you won? And he said, publicity. And I said, do you get much notoriety in Division II? He said, well, here in Cleveland, it would put us on the map. Now, Notre Dame and South Bend, everybody knows what that is. He said to me, what would it do for you? And I said, I would produce national astonishment that we play football. Historicism. <laughs> 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 it's the idea that history is a force and a progress, and it moves. It builds on itself. It means that anybody who lives in any age is dominant. And that's a gloomy thing. Frank Goodnow, uh, one of Woodrow Wilson's friends, he invented the American Political Science Association. It's one of the early ones of these guys. He writes, uh, we teachers take ourselves too seriously sometimes because we think that our students will be influenced by what we teach them, whereas really, the economic conditions that prevail in the future are going to form their opinion. Isn't that a gloomy thing for a teacher to say? Right? And of course, he would despair, except he thought of this hopeful thing. You know, historicism is the view that everything is change. The only constant is change. But, and that's gloomy, that's terrible, right? It means we all think everything we think because we live here and now. But, and you know, we're a relatively conservative crown. That must be something to do with our parents or how much money we make, right? And that, that would make you despair, as Frank Goodnow sort of sounds despairing. But then they think of another thing. If it's true that the whole process of history dominates everything, doesn't it change the situation if we know that? To put it in terms that Hegel put it in, because you know, Hegel, he's in Marx, Hegel's more serious than Marx, although less destructive. Um, Hegel's got this problem. If it's true that everything you think is a product of the time in which you're thinking and the pressures and circumstances of the world in which you live, how could you know that that was the truth? And Hegel says, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. At the end of history, you can see the historical process. These people think that we have come at a moment where we can understand the process of history by which we are created. And because we know it, now we can get control of it. And we can become our own creator which is how first higher education and then the government got convert, converted from what it was into an engineering project to make us into something else. And I will tell you, Republican and Democrat, and exempting, by the way, the current administration, which is better, and Reagan's, which was better, they think that they just have to get the standards right and the rules right, and then everything will get better. And I say, that's despotic. Every class I teach, I'm the same teacher for every class, every person in it. And I only, only when I became a teacher, rather later in life, did I realize. I used to say, I know about Winston Churchill, and I know about Aristotle, and I about American Revolution and all, because I had the best teachers in the world. I still argue. But when I became a teacher, I figured out, you know, they had a lot of teachers, a lot of students. Not all of them listened. And it's not just listening, it's working. Do you see what that means for human freedom? I mean, it's decisive, right? 
So I, I learned, running Hillsdale College, I learned when I came, because this is the only job I've ever had in college. It's 20 years now, so I've been doing it a while. I thought, if we do our work right, we can help any of them. can They must help themselves. That's why we have an honor card. That's why we demand so much of the students up front before they come. Because they're going to have to work. They're going to have to work until their heads droop. They're going to have to work until their fingers hurt. And they're going to have to master themselves and change themselves to learn. And that takes desire. I mean, it takes ability, but willingness is more important. Think what it means that we just think that by passing a rule, everybody can have a higher education. Think how demeaning that is to people. That's our situation. And it's essentially despotic in its nature. So now, my last topic is the one that Jenna asked me to talk about. Uh, and that is, what's a college supposed to be like? Well, I make some claims for our college. But um, you just have to name a few principles that are mostly startling to people. First of all, do you know what the word college means? It means partnership. You know, it is not a world of our right to represent what we represent. You're not supposed to represent anything. You're supposed to look for the truth of the matter. And that means by, you know what it is to be objective? You require to forget about yourself. And that leads to each other. You know, faculty too. I'll say, no, cut that out. Well, he said this, and I'll say, yeah, argue with him. But not that. You see? Because, you know, we don't lock our stuff. I live in the middle of a nationally famous college campus, and I don't have any keys to my house. I think my wife does, but she can't find it. <laughs> if we ever need to log the house, we'd have to call security. See, we leave our backpacks strong everywhere, all over the campus. But that's only a manifestation of the larger thing. You can talk to anybody. When freshmen show up, they, uh, you know, because I'm, let's say, an aggressive Socratic teacher. So, uh, I will get on to the question of the good. And you know, that's the first and last question in philosophy. That's Socrates' question. He's always, he's always asked the question in Greek, TSD, what is it? What is that thing? You know? And he's always interrupting people when they say, when they make a claim about their life they're living. And he asks them to prove that that's the good life. And they never can, right? which indicates, by the way, the highest activity possible to human beings, which is to seek in a systematic way to know the good. So freshmen will always say, well, to me it means, and I always say, you know, we don't care about that. <laughs> I'm asking you what it is. And they pause, and I say, see, it's harder now, isn't it? Now we're going to think for a change. And that activity, Knowledge is not a possession. It's an activity. You know, you know, if you learned something a long time ago and you don't think about it, you don't remember it very well. A language even, right? I always tell today, my freshman today that I tortured in front of a distinguished visitor. It's a favorite thing to do. I said to them, you know, in the end, because it became moving and gray, and a lot of people said a bunch of really handsome things. And I said, you must remember, if you come to Hillsdale College not meaning to win a serious life, you are a dang fool. And you're going to waste all this. Don't do it. It costs us too much money. You pay a fraction of it. Katie O'Donnell and all you. Right? What she needs? She's got some other name. Anyway, you see, it's the tone of it. The point of it. It is the closest thing. So I have to tell a boxer story so you can see what it's about. Uh, there's a lady who has boxer dogs. Is that you? Yeah. She gave me this handsome book. So I, my wife and I, I uh, 
I'm married to a very lovely English woman. We're having our 40th anniversary on Saturday. And I fear that I've lived during her life. But um, we have these boxer dogs. And the point is, we just love these dogs. And she takes care of them like they're our children. We have four, and they're grown. And here's what I discovered watching the dogs and the kids. For the first two years, you raise the dogs and the kids the same way. They eat, on, they eat each other's food, food, they live on the floor, and they hear all the same stuff. And then about, and, and then this is very common, right? And we don't understand the miracle. About age two, the kids start talking, and the dogs never do. And six months after, they start talking. They know buffaloes and seals. They know continents and islands. They know space and the sea. They know everything, and they don't even have to leave the house. You see what a liberation that is? It's magic, and nobody can explain how we do it. By the way, I, I was going to use the well, because she's sitting there, I can see her. Jane, I happen to know, is a very fine woman. And Richard's okay. Uh, and everybody who knows Jane, by the way, thinks that. Always thinks, you know, I'm an old man now and I've known her forever. But she's just a child. But you know, if Jane were the woman, the idea of the woman, then there'd only be one. Because the rest of you are women too, right? And she has an essence in her that's added to the details about her that makes her what she is. The Greeks are the classics. And classic class is a synonym for kind. <coughs> the kinds of things. And it's magical that we know that. And we know it with every time we use a common noun. What's a common noun? Except a category of which you will never see an instance. I'm sorry, you will never see the perfect instance, but you will recognize every single instance you see of it automatically. And the Greeks, Aristotle's one I know the best. What they teach us is this ability to do that, to see the kinds of things, is to see the essence of the thing, or the being of the thing, or the good of the thing. And those are synonyms. Aristotle likes to write, the good and being are convertible terms. If I say that Jane is a woman, it's a synonym for saying that she's a good woman, or that she has the being of a woman. And if something happened, like, uh, you should watch the movie Downfall. It's uh, Hitler in the bunker in the last days. And it's very powerful. It's taken from his diaries that his secretaries recovered. And he was a maniac, right? He was like a beast at the end because he had completely and utterly ruined himself. Willfully and on purpose, by the way. Aristotle says you can only become fully vicious or fully virtuous by deliberate and sustained intent. And not many people achieve that. Most of us are just pretty good. Right? Most of us are not pretty bad. You see? And so, he was not a man anymore. And to understand the political significance of this, this will be my last point. To understand the political significance of this point, it just so happens that we live in the first country in human history that is born on the idea that you can know what a human being is and that they're all created equal. Explaining it in the last letter he ever wrote, Thomas, a few days before the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence on which he died, he writes, it just means that some are not born with saddles on their backs, nor others booted and spurred to ride them. We're not horses. And you know, tell them the difference between George Washington and Adolf Hitler is just as easy as telling the difference between a human being and a horse. Because it's the same problem. Hitler had made himself not quite human anymore. 
You see, that potential in us, that capacity in us, that's unique in us, that's what defines us. And we have adopted doctrines, enforced in detailed rules, starting from the top, enhanced by Republicans and Democrats alike, that eliminate that understanding for public education. All you gotta do is read the Common Core. I can show it to you. The word now for a teacher is a deliverer of education, a delivery boy or girl. We're probably, well, we're certainly the first college with a charter that says man and woman, black and white, all of them. And lately, I've been learning what the girls did when they graduated. First of all, back in the day when our academic standards were really high, you had to know Latin and Greek to get in. What happened to these girls? They were teachers. And that means symbols of wisdom in their community. When there was a hard thing to figure out, everybody went and asked this woman. The men might do something else, right? Because they were brought to the support. So, to take that status, my father was a high school teacher in Arkansas. To take that status and demean it as if it's just a conveyor belt. And to demean the students in thinking that by rules, made from above by people who do not work with young people, and also, by the way, in my experience, and I've met many of them, have no education worthy of the name. That is the source and the most vivid example of the despotism that comes over America. The college is supposed to be, my question is, what should it be like? It is an activity of love, of learning, that unites everyone in it with intense work and makes friendship that in the eighth and ninth book of Aristotle's Ethics is said to be the highest possible human association. And the wickedness that has taken over our country comes from an effacement Effacement, effacing of that, and it will lead to despotism over everybody in this room. And it's got to be stopped for the beauty of learning and for the goodness of freedom. And it can't be.
But how was Hitler defeated? Well, the answer was everybody around him, except the lead henchmen, were waiting for a chance to stab him in the back. So you start with this, right? These doctrines that dominate education, it, it's not, you know, they're sophisticated. What drives relativism among the young is, you know, if anything's okay, if you think it's okay, young people are very passionate. So they like the sound of that. And other people do too. But historicism, the idea is, we can get control of everything, right? And that was tempting, is tempting. But the truth is, it doesn't work, and we can see it. And I'll get, you know, there's an unsettlement in the country, right? The, the bureaucratic form of government, by the way, brings from Asia all the way around the world and back to Asia. Everywhere it's governed that way. The Chinese government, a lot of them are educated in the United States. And what do they think they're doing except managing the society? Right? But Nowhere where it runs is anyone happy with it. So what I think is we have to have a recovery of known things. I'll tell you, we started all these charter schools. There are uh, 15,000 students in it. Everybody has to learn Latin. Everybody has to wear a uniform. Everybody has to sign the honor code, and the parents do. There are 8,000 people on the list. We can't find headmasters. I'm going to confess to you people that I sort of slightly tried to recruit Jenna there for a minute. Um, we can't find headmasters fast enough. And teachers. To the demand from the parents. It's a mass phenomenon, right? So what I think is all of this, it's just like Nazi Germany, right? It's vulnerable because it's ugly and there are beautiful things to In other words, I think we're going to wipe the floor. Good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Terrence. Uh, if I recall, my uh, Latin education comes from the Latin word recuperate, which means to draw out. Or lead forth. Okay. Well, draw out, I have in mind, particularly because that's different than what you were talking about. So different. How different? You need to tell me a little more. Well, drawing out means that you're drawing out the best or whatever the capacity of the student is, as opposed to filling the mind with the free digestive things. Well, so first of all, I'll say you don't fill their mind. They do. Uh, I had, uh, I was at another college. Brand X. And, uh, I was on a long panel, and it's a Christian college that doesn't understand the importance of the first miracle, which was one of my grievances against it. But this guy said, uh, "You guys are picking that up, aren't you?" And uh, this guy said, "We're going to go to bed, and we're going to plug something in our hands, and that's how we're going to learn." And he regretted it, but there's no stop. And I said, that's impossible. And he said, why? And I said, do you get tired when you think and study? It's a mental and moral effort. And so now it can become ease, easy, nothing to it. You know, the human being is a body and a soul. And so I didn't mean to say that we put anything in there. We mean, I mean, they take it. Can you help them? So draw it out. Uh, there's, a, there's a claim in Plato that, uh, it's, uh, that uh, learning is all remembered. And I don't think so, but I see what the weight of the argument is. Because here's the thing. If uh, this rational fa faculty we have, and remember, the rational faculty is the same thing as speech. That means whatever we can think, we can say. And that means we are made to work together more than any being on earth. Aristotle says more than horses and bees. Because whatever we can think, we can say. Others can understand. 
So the thing is, if you, uh, the Platonic Dialogues, but also Aristotle's treatises, are written in a dialogue like form. And then Aristotle writes this explicitly, it's his purpose. He says, you start with the things you know right now. And then a bunch of people start talking about it. And they find contradictions, and they introduce new information, and the truth, whatever it is that's found, is the product of them all. It's a, it's a, it's close, it's a very tight thing, right? And the claim of the classics, and I believe it's demonstrated true time and again, is that's the way to learn. You know, how many people have a really good friend from college? And did you learn something with them that's part of the bond? Right? And so, yeah, I don't draw out, no. <coughs> they take, so, uh, uh, it's a Greek word, hexis. Uh, it's uh, translated rightly as uh, character sometimes. It's uh, uh, my favorite translator, translated as active condition. But what it contains the sense is, of is taking hold of something. You know, Aristotle says, by the way, the way the virtues are born in here is through your choices. Uh, because choices are fun about human beings, and only we make them, right? And the hard choices are the ones that shape your character, because there's always something that you want to do and something you think you ought to do, and they're not the same. And the question is, which do you do? And, and that, that's what makes you what you are, the doing of that. And his claim then is, you know, if a dog is hungry, it will steal food, and it won't be guilty about it unless it, it thinks you caught it. You know, it's all just, this happens and this happens with them. But people can steal food, and they feel like they have to justify it later. And so the point is, we know, we are listening, Aristotle says. We can hear this voice, and your character is formed by whether you listen to it or not. And then, learning is a little different than form, forming your moral character. You know, you've you got to get your blood pressure up. In the best classes, you know, what's it like? It's like a divine experience, and people are excited and they've helped to build something. I taught a class one time, and you know, I'm a pretty good teacher, and I teach every term, but every teacher is pretty good, and has good students, which is a tremendous blessing. Uh, I once made a mistake, and I made one of my classes read the entirety of John C. Calhoun's Disposition of Government, which is 500 pages and nearly impossible. He was the great apostle of slavery in America. And I was supposed to assign an extract, but I misread something. I was new. And so they all read that whole dang thing. And when I found that out, you know, I was they were a little angry and a little proud. I said, okay, then we're gonna talk about the whole thing. In the last class we spent six hours on it. Should have spent one. We had to hurry through other things. In the last class, there was, it was a classroom where there's uh, whiteboards all there and all there on two sides. And they were all full. You want to know where slavery comes from? John C. Calhoun writes this sentence. It would be impious to think that God would give us the gift of natural science and permit us to use it for ill. Now, if you just think about that for a few minutes, that means power is everything. That's just historicism. It's just really a doctrine of power. Hitler is its perfect representative. But Calhoun, too. And he thought, we're evolving, and these black ones have not evolved so far, but we're to own them. The upending of the Declaration of Independence, right? And so I wrote that up, and we talked about that for two hours. And at the end, all of it, the whole thing was arrayed on all these boards. And then I said, OK, 
Okay, that's it. And we all sat there for five minutes reading the boards. And I said, is that it? And see, we had done that together. And we were better because we were all helping. That's my point. And, and just, you want to know how the Constitution of the United States works? It starts at the bottom and goes up, right? Today, the bureaucratic form stops at the top and goes down. In the old way of American government, a few simple rules, relatively few, and you know, of course, in the Declaration of Independence of the Constitution, the Constitution of the United States is 4,000 words long. And, and that means that those are not really so much rules as they are goals. And you can govern people much better by goals than by rules. Get them to agree. Let's try to do this. And then they will help you, and their own noggin will get involved. That was the American government. Now, it's scientific in the sense that we are the subject of a scientific experiment. And so they write these laws that have thousands of pages, and no one can read them. So my point is, yeah, not draw, draw out, leave for it. And we're all marching somewhere together. But the translation is good, the one you name. Anything else? Oh, thank you. I think we should probably end there. Thank you so much, Dr. R. Thank you and good night.